Yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. And I would like to just welcome everybody to this Living Sustainably Through Creative Reuse webinar. Um, we are so glad you came today. My name is Kim Bailey and I'm a naturalist here at Warner Park Nature Center. Because um, of Friends of Warner Park, we are here tonight. They support us in so many ways and um, they provide um, staffing and program funds. So we are grateful for them. During this webinar, you're gonna be able to see and hear Leah and I, but um, we can't see you. So if you have a question or comment, please use the Q&A or the chat button, which are down at the bottom of the screen. Um, and I will be monitoring them throughout the pre presentation and ask when, when I can. If for some reason you're kicked off of the webinar and it suddenly closes, don't freak out or anything, just close Zoom and reconnect with the link you received. You can also, um, if you have any, communi any communication issues, you can send our, um, through the chat some questions and our tech support will help you, or you can call the Nature Center at 615-862-8555. So, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce one of the most creative, energetic minds that I know. <laughs> Leah Sherry is the Executive Director of Turnip Green Creative Reuse. She was named one of Nashville Business Journal's Women of Influence this year. And after you hear her presentation, you're going to understand why. Barely into her 30s, Leah's reach is far and wide. Her passion about the environment, education, and art have been channeled into numerous effective actions for sustainability. We're so glad to have you here tonight, Leah. Welcome. Thank you. I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Try not to be freaked out by all the tabs. They're gonna disappear. Can you see it, Kim? Okay, great. So, um, and then Kim, if you'll do me a favor, since I'm sharing my screen, um, if you'll just make sure to interrupt me whenever there's a poll, if I start to skip over one, just to stay on track with that. But hey, everyone, thanks for the um, lovely introduction. My name is Leah Sherry, like Kim mentioned. Um, I work with Turn of Green Creative Reuse and a few other organizations. And I really wanted to take, um, thank you, a few minutes to talk about um, not just where I am right now in my sustainability journey, but kind of what kicked it all off and a little bit about my story. So one thing I like to tell um, a lot of people, kind of a fun fact about me is that I was raised communally. So until I was 18 years old, um, I lived on a compound called the Piney Compound, which you can see some pictures up here. Um, and that's just kind of, you know, the seeds that started this journey that, um, that has grown and grown, and I hope continues to grow. And it was located in Arkansas, right on the river. Um, and I was lucky enough to be exposed and just heavily immersed in a reuse culture, specifically with reuse design and reuse building um, from literally from day one. So we have, I just shared a couple examples of structures um, on the Piney Compound, it's nearly 20 acres of just stuff like this. And every single piece of wood um, or metal or anything you see has been completely repurposed, found from um, mostly our land or our friends' and neighbors' lands, like trees that may have fallen or things of that nature. Um, and we all, it was always all hands on deck, building all of these structures that then we would enjoy as a community. Um, here is a behind the scenes picture of one of those reuse builders, and that is me. This is usually um, what I looked like. I was always wearing some big old boots on the farm, um, usually working hard and then passing out kind of like a cat. Um, so this, I feel like this picture is very representative of my childhood. Oh, parts of this slide didn't load. Show anyway. That's okay. Um, half of the family, that's enough. So one thing about growing up communally is that there are just a lot of people and that, that can be a really wonderful thing and teach you a lot um, just about how to work with different folks, age levels, abilities, skill sets, all the things. So this is just a sampling of some of my um, siblings and cousins and all of the kids. I was one of eight kids who lived consistently on the compound. Um, and then I, of course, had to picture my, my doggo, Peter, who you may see, he might make an appearance tonight. 
Um, but this was when he was a puppy. He's 11 now. So he's, he's had a long life on the compound and been all, along for the sustainability journey as well. Um, I also like to mention the person who actually started the Piney Compound, who's my grandma. She is our fearless leader. She's one of my sheroes, still one of my best friends. She, you can tell just in these photos um, a little bit about her. She's very adventurous, courageous, um, just a brave, brilliant woman. She's a pioneer um, and, and she was definitely a pioneer in some sustainability methods that heavily influenced my life and the work I do today. And this is her skydiving for her 70th birthday. So I can only hope to be as wild as her when I'm that age. <laughs> um, so just with that upbringing of um, just being raised with a lot of different folks, a lot of kids, and um, being around a, a bunch of different people, like my grandpa was a, a computer programmer in the Pentagon. So he like thought it was really important that I was exposed to computers and coding. Um, he taught me how to start coding when I was in elementary school, which is kind of weird for the 90s and especially for a kid on a compound in rural Arkansas. But it's just, um, it goes to show kind of like the well-rounded like things I was exposed to and people I was exposed to. Um, I really believed in education. So I took some natural next steps to when I was 14, I launched a tutoring business. I saw that there was a need um, in the community I grew up in. There weren't any special services for kids with special needs in our school system. So I started um, working with some of those families who had kids on the autism spectrum specifically, started a tutoring business, went for nine years. Um, that helped me pay for my college. My, my family was awesome, but they just didn't have a lot of resources or, or um, money. So I did have to pay for all of my own bills, buy my first car, pay through college. So I, um, the tutoring business really helped do that, but it also helped me learn a lot more about education and how to work with all kinds of different kids in that format. So I did go to school to become a teacher. I became an algebra teacher. That was really hard. Um, I, I'm really good at algebra, but working with high schoolers was really challenging. <laughs> so I decided to try elementary art instead. Um, once again, it was very fun. Um, I, I loved working with kids in the art, but it had a lot of challenges, but it was still really formative and taught me a lot of lessons once again, which I incorporate into my work today. So similarly to how I grew up, um, we had to be really resourceful in the classroom too. So when you don't have a lot of money, you don't have a big budget, yet you have all of these needs and things you have to accomplish, you start to get really creative and you start to really start working with people and looking at materials and things in a different type of way, because that's what you have to do. So I had nearly 700 kids that I was teaching every single week, Title I schools, which are like the priority highest need schools. Um, have a picture of my student, Lexis Vang Thang here. She was such, such a little joy, I loved her. Um, but we, we had to get really creative because I did not have a budget to teach uh, or to buy art supplies for our kids. So we started doing things like working with cardboard boxes. You can see an Andy Goldsworthy inspired project on the right. So we would go outside and we would find leaves and twigs and we would just create from nature and from what was um, going into the trash can, we would divert those materials. And we just did a lot of creative reuse in the classroom. And I wasn't intending on doing this, but I ended up basically creating a reuse arts curriculum, which I have built upon at Turnip Green and been able to use with a lot of kids in Nashville too. So kids were awesome, that's all great. But this is literally a picture of me after, like right when I was about to leave teaching and you can tell by the look on my face, just I was very tired and worn down. And as, as many wonderful experiences as I had gained, I just knew in my heart for my own health that I had to move on to something new just to kind of get a breather and um, to sort of re-energize for the next stage. And so that next stage was Nashville. Um, not a ton of strategy, 
<laughs> find that decision, just like needed to go somewhere new and Nashville was only seven hours away, so why not? And I ended up connecting with so many people. I was able to start working with these three new organizations because of meeting people in Nashville. Um, and Peter's here. Look, this is 11 year old Peter. But I also got two new pets, the cats Sparkler and Scamper. So Nashville has been a great next phase. Oh, I'm sorry, they're not loading. Um, but we'll just go to this one. Why not? So I um, definitely in my, my Nashville phase, especially when I first moved here, it really allowed me a lot more time, space, and energy to do something that's great, which is reconnect with myself. Um, and I, I just re-found my love of creating myself, not necessarily always teaching people how to create and like working with kids, but also taking some time for myself to make things, especially repurposing materials that I knew would have been thrown away otherwise. Um, so I have an example of a giant like globe that I still have that lights up that I made out of all recycled newspaper and it's painted with paint that I made from dried up markers. So this is an example of creative reuse all the way. Um, the, the cool thing about creative reuse and just intersecting with Turnip Green and finding this organization is that it really, um, it really helped me realize that creative reuse can be a multifaceted approach to support our community. It's not just like a simple in the box one and done concept. You can do so much with it. Um, and so my sustainability journey has led me here and I kind of wanted to then flip it to talk about the journey of our waste too, because that's, that's very much an interesting journey as well. Um, so speaking of that journey, here is a question for the group. Where does your trash go when you throw it away? <laughs> so think about that, because we definitely live in a culture where whenever I was in the classroom, at least as a child and as a teacher, I always heard the, the phrase, go throw this away. So just kind of setting that expectation that whenever you throw something away, it magically disappears and it's not your problem anymore. But the unfortunate thing <laughs> is that a way is actually a real place. Um, and a way is if it goes into the waste basket when you're throwing an item out, a way is a landfill. Um, so that's, that's kind of the sad truth of it. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about landfills and sort of like the disadvantages to them and what we can do um, instead of landfilling. But there's, this can just be such a huge conversation. There are so many reasons landfills are negative um, and we can talk about that all day. So I just kind of wanted to like start with a very simple journey of an apple. So let's think about an apple. And I, I want everybody to, um, to answer this question. I'm, so I need to ask the question, right, Kim? I'm sorry, because the, or do you have the poll? I'm happy, I'm happy to ask it. Oh, um, has a question. it in the <laughs> if you, if you'll type your answer in the chat, how long does it take an apple to break down in a landfill? Two weeks, two months, two years, or two decades? Put your guess in the, in the chat for us and we'll see what people think. Two weeks, two months, two years, or two decades? I'm getting two months, two decades, two years. <laughs> We're getting it all over the place. Two you months, know what that two means? Weeks. It's an opportunity for us to all learn something new. Because if everybody answered the same yeah. thing, I'd be like, what's the point of this? They already know everything. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The answers have literally been everything except for two decades. So it's pretty much across the board, two weeks, two months, right. two years. So... If you type that it takes an apple um, two years to break down in a landfill, that's actually the correct answer um, based on Metro Public Works research and what they've told um, the community with their studies. So who how many people type two years? One person, two? Um, four people. Ooh, four people. nice. Four people get to come yeah. to Turnip Green Creative Reuse and get themselves a reuse trophy with someone else's name on it and probably for a sport or activity you've never participated in. Congratulations. 
Um, so two years is the answer. That's a long time for an apple to break down and obviously a lot longer than our minds, you know, we're thinking it breaks a lot faster. I did too. I would have gotten that answer way wrong if I wouldn't have read Metro uh, Public Works report. But one difference between a landfill, if you take your apple and you choose to throw something, throw that core in the trash can, as opposed to taking it to either your own compost pile or a Metro Public Works drop-off site or even a compost pickup site or pickup um, service, which those are all options you can explore, um, the compost pile will break down or decompose your apple in just two months. So that is a really big difference. And um, this is, these are some reasons why the, that timeline is so different. So the main thing is our friend oxygen. So oxygen is basically taken out of landfill sites. And so it's a lot harder for things to decompose at the rate that we like see them decompose. Like if you see um, a banana peel on the side of the road and it turns brown really, really quickly, that's not gonna happen as fast in a landfill because it doesn't have the oxygen. But in a compost pile, I almost picture it as like a living, breathing thing where it has oxygen and organisms breaking down and helping um, be decomposers. So that's one, re or one difference. Um, and then the apple's next life in the compost versus the landfill, that's another difference. So not just while they're there, but what do they turn into once they do decompose? So if you put it in your compost, Obviously, it's going to turn into like awesome, healthy soil, which it doesn't stop there. It could turn into another apple. It could turn, you know, into all kinds of things to feed um, the food that you eat or the beautiful flowers that you grow or trees that provide oxygen. Obviously, it just keeps giving and giving and giving. So this is kind of like an example of reuse in nature. But you know, whenever we put it in a trash can, takes that two years, it's in the landfill site, it's going to turn into harmful emissions and pollutants and just, it's not gonna give back to us in a healthy, productive way, um, unfortunately. <laughs> so whenever we're talking about the landfill or this away place, we, you know, that's, that's important to know. It takes longer for it to break down in a landfill. That's, that's bad, whatever. But like, how does that really impact us and others? And then, because we always want to end on a um, productive, positive action step, what can we actually do about this? We all have power to do some things about this. Um, I think, speaking of power, I think knowledge is power. So we should all really know about our specific landfill and where our trash is going. If you live in Davidson County, you're away or your landfill is in Rutherford County at the Middle Point um, landfill. And there are hundreds of garbage trucks going there every single day. And depending on who you speak with, this landfill only has about five to eight years left before it's totally filled, closed up at capacity. And the next landfill site that they're scouting is twice as far. So what happens next? Um, I really hope that we're all around in five to eight years and we're gonna be here to experience this. And we also might have kids or friends with kids and there are other people and animals who will be impacted too beyond us. So if the next landfill site, five to eight years, is two times as far away, Think about those like 500 garbage trucks going every single day. It's obviously going to cost more money. It's obviously going to cause more emissions that we're all breathing. Um, and we're going to suffer from that. That money has to come from somewhere. And there's, there's a good chance that we're going to see that being reflected in you know, some, some payments we have to make, to be quite honest. So we, we want to be mindful of these things that impact us financially and our health. So the other really horrible thing um, is that this impacts all of us. 
And particularly and disproportionately, this impacts low income communities of color. And because of that, climate justice is a really important initiative. And if you are lucky enough to not live near a dump or a landfill um, and be breathing these you know, toxins in and suffering in this way, that's great, but just keep in mind that there are many, many communities who have to deal with this on a real level and they're suffering every single day. Um, they are being taken advantage of and there are ways that we can all participate to help fight this good fight of climate justice. Once again, knowledge is power. We need to educate ourselves. Um, if I always am talking about effective altruism because I meet so many cool, passionate people who are ready to jump right in and help, I think if we can all just figure out like what are existing initiatives and how can we further that impact, it's much more of a deeper, not wider sort of philosophy. And that's how we can get stuff done better and faster. So I would encourage everyone on this call to look into some climate justice issues and action. And we did include, include a link. Um, this is a really informative article with action steps that you can take away. And then on a more um, specific local level, Nashville actually does have a zero waste master plan in place. And I think it's like 900 pages. And I know that sounds like an exaggeration, like 900 pages, but it really is. Um, so it's very thorough. And there are also meeting notes from all of like the planning sessions and the high level points. I think that everybody should take a peek at that and see what our city um, is planning to do to address some of these issues of the landfill about to close and some of our low income communities suffering um, at a disproportionate rate because of landfill and climate injustices and see what they're up to and see what you can do to support the things that you believe in because there are some really great things in this plan. I'm not gonna lie, um, it makes me feel hopeful. So more resources will be provided throughout this presentation. And maybe even some of you have some resources I won't touch on because there's a ton of ways to plug in. So as we're thinking about our own sustainability journeys, this is gonna be um, a question that you can type the answer into the chat if you'd like. Where we always hear these R words like reduce, reuse, recycle, and there are others too. So what do you think are some of the most important R words, whether it's one I included or maybe one that I didn't put up on the screen. So I've got repurpose, mm. recreation, Ooh. or I could say recreation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure which way they met. <laughs> Responsibility. Oh, I love that. I like that one too. Rot. Mm hmm. Definitely rot. And so rot is, I'm sure, I'm sure everybody knows this, but sometimes I get asked. So I'll say it, but rot um, is compost. The four R's. Yeah, I, I really like all of those answers. And I agree, those are all super important. Um, refuse is one that I really am trying to integrate more into my vocabulary regularly, because um, sometimes we end up with materials and then we're like, oh, now we have to choose what to do with it. If it's something we didn't need in the first place, it would have been better to just refuse it. And then that would be reducing too. Um, so Thinking about all of these R words, I am from Turnip Green Creative Reuse. I am a reuse artist and they all are important to fight the sustainability fight, but we are gonna be talking tonight mostly about reuse. Um, so the definition is up here on the screen. It's an environmentally preferred alternative to other waste manage management methods. And essentially it keeps new resources from being used for just a little while longer. And it keeps old resources from entering the waste stream. And it's a step toward a circular economy, which is um, a concept that I'm pretty intrigued by. And this is just like a very high level overview of 
linear versus radius versus circular economy. Right now, we're in a linear economy, which is the first one. So basically, our non-recyclable waste is kind of going, we kind of have this like step one, step two, step three, and it goes into the landfill. Um, and a reuse economy does help um, reduce the amount of time that or it basically helps extend the life of those materials, but a lot of times they'll still end up in the landfill. So it helps, but it's not perfect. And then a circular econ economy is like the ultimate goal um, to live very sustainably where it's they're just continuing to circulate and creative reuse and reuse can be a huge help in the circular economy too. But for thinking about the dream, that's where we would wanna be. And it takes all of us to get oh, there. Yeah. Yes. Leah, let's ask a quick question, but also wanted to say another person said reclaim is another R word. Yes, good um, which might have um, So this is the question for you guys. Which of these items are reusable? Old, old mail, dry magic markers, a torn t-shirt, a broken toy, or all of the above? Put your answer in the chat. Hmm, I've got lots of those items, <laughs> particularly <laughs> the old mail, all that junk mail. Yeah. Ooh, everybody is saying all of the above. We've got people on board tonight. Yay, that's awesome. So now you all get to come get a trophy. Some of you get two. <laughs> uh, perfect. So exactly right. And I love that question, Kim. Um, sometimes we think about things like broken toys as maybe being trash. Like, what are we going to do with that? But all of these items can have a second life, even if it wasn't necessarily what its first life was intended for. So that's what creative reuse is all about. Um, I do want to be clear that there are so many different types of reuse. And once again, this would be a very long presentation if I went over all of these. But in case you do want to look up um, some of these other examples of reuse and their definitions and examples, there is a link provided. Um, so you can learn more. But we're gonna talk about creative reuse and I'm gonna talk for a couple minutes, more minutes about Turnip Green Creative Reuse. And our mission is fostering creativity and sustainability through reuse. And about Turnip Green, we are a local nonprofit here in Nashville. We're located in the Wedgwood Houston district. And basically what we are trying to do at Turnip Green is keep materials out of the landfill and then reconnect those materials back with people who need them. So we see a lot of teachers, a lot of artists, a lot of students, but everyone is welcome to Turnip Green. Oh, I hit something, captions, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Um, at Turnip Green, we live our mission in four different ways. We have reused green galleries, an open studio workspace, a reuse shopping and donation center, and education outreach programming. And I really like to also include our core values because we do believe in being an inclusive and sp safe space for everyone to be able to create. We believe materials and creative experiences should be accessible to every single person, no matter what. So we do that in a few ways at our creative reuse shopping and donation center. Um, we take in items that might be hard to find another home for. So like, let's talk about one of those examples that was on the, the question you all just answered, a broken toy. Um, Goodwill might not always take a weird broken toy. A recycling bin might not always take a broken toy if you really follow the rules. So you know someone could use that broken toy. It like has so much potential in life, but where do you take that? That's the kind of stuff that you would take to turn up green. And there is a huge need for that kind of stuff. And I can tell you, because we get 200 pounds of materials donated every single hour we are open. And we have been in existence for nearly 10 years and we have continued to see that number trend up. So I can tell you from a data standpoint and from a 
I have gotten some big old muscles from moving all of this stuff standpoint that there is a huge need for this. Um, but we also have to make sure not just to take in the items, but then it goes back out to the community in a productive way. So one way we keep everything accessible is allowing people in six days a week during our regular hours and everything is pay whatever you can afford. Um, especially as a former uh, educator who couldn't afford materials and had to buy them all out of pocket. I know this is really important for teachers. As an artist, you have to have materials to be a successful artist generally. So this is another, um, this is another career that sometimes they're very undervalued when it comes to pay and so they need, they need affordable materials. So that's why we see a lot of teachers and artists, but once again, everyone is welcome here. We have just about everything you could imagine. Whenever COVID goes away, <laughs> we will reopen our open studio workspace and you all will be able to come in whenever you'd like, grab materials off of our shelves, gather with your friends, and you can make things using our materials and tools. And we also have green galleries and um, I am such like an artist type person that likes to like touch and feel and explore. So we try to keep a lot of our gallery exhibitions fairly interactive. Um, this was one that we showed last year. Once again, this is a different type of mask that we're wearing. I just thought about that. These were way more fun masks. Um, but this is uh, during an opening reception at one of our green galleries, we feature artists who use repurposed materials. These masks are made out of all, um, they're basically like paper mache, so repurposed newspapers, um, and he turned them into masks based off of endangered species that he encountered on his studies um, when he was going to every national park. So we got to wear them and dance around in them all night. And this is my partner, Ryan. <laughs> um, then the other area of service, the fourth, last but not least, reuse arts education programs. We do these for students and adults. So the first slide is talking about the students' programs. Um, we call those turnip sprouts. And we basically take materials from our Creative Reuse Center that you just saw, and we connect them to a STEAM curriculum, and then we bring them to the schools. We really believe in paying our artists. So we hire our teaching artists and pay them a livable wage to work with these kids and these materials. We also, during the pandemic, we found, um, I was getting phone calls, honestly, on my cell phone from a lot of families saying, we need eight to four childcare. We don't know what to do with our kids. We can't afford daycare. So we actually launched um, an eight to four childcare service this year in their very like limited groups learning pods that were working with the kids. We have free aftercare programs in Metro schools. We're actually the largest provider of free aftercare programs. We also are doing a ton of virtual learning camps, kind of like this, and creativity kit resource distribution. And these are some of our adorable turnip sprouts who I love so much. Um, we also do reuse education programs for adults. We do litter pickups. Pick up for a pint is a good one. 21 plusers, um, that's where you get to pick up litter and you get rewarded in a pint of beer. Believe it or not, we get a lot of people coming to pick up litter at those. Uh, we do river cleanups, composting, birthday parties, library workshops, festival booths, and we do creativity kits for adults as well. And I had to include one of our favorite partners, Warner Park, who we've worked with a few times and just so glad to be able to continuing this partnership. Um, but yeah, we've done on the left, we've done um, looks like a river cleanup and then on the right, some summer camp activities with the kids bringing our reuse materials. So one thing that's also super great about creative reuse is um, like adults actually say this to me a lot. They're like, oh, I'm not an artist. And I'm like, oh, you probably are, you just don't know it. But the thing about creative reuse is you can be really creative with how you approach it. And that means there's a way to find a space for every single person within it. So I love this example because the NFL is about the farthest thing from something I know about or participate in or anything. Um, I'm just not much of a, a sportser. Um, but whenever the NFL draft came to town, because there were so many people excited and there were going to be so many people coming in from all over, 
from a sustainability lens rather than someone who knows a lot about football, um, my team and I could really only think about all of the waste that might come because of this event. And, you know, that's pretty disheartening to think about, but it's also a reminder that we all have power to suggest creative ways to be sustainable and to partner with people to educate them and take action. So the way that Turnip Green did that whenever the NFL draft came into town, we basically um, asked for some meetings. Luckily, we got them. We found out exactly, we got an inventory, a spreadsheet of all of the different things that they said, well, these are the things we're going to have to throw away. Lots of signage, banners, um, the stage, Literally, they built a stage and like, we're gonna have to throw this away. Um, so we worked with them and we came up with creative reuse solutions for everything. And they literally had to rent us a storage unit because there were 6,000 pounds of just these signs and banners. Um, but it's really wonderful that they were able to work with us in this capacity because you can see examples of what some of these things turned into. So this is an artist who works with us regularly who made clothes out of them. And then she's able to sell them and then basically bring in some revenue for herself, which that's great to see with, with artists. Uh, we also had some of the footballs being cut in half. And these artists were using scrap wood to create musical instruments out of them. So just like tapping into even another sort of creative art form, which is music. And at the, um, I'll go back one slide, at the actual NFL draft, they agreed to <laughs> meet my request that we got to put up a reuse art gallery. And we had kids coming up to our booth playing those footballs. And we got the opportunity to tell people who were there for what they thought was football, a little bit about sustainability and the arts and artists in Nashville. The other thing I love about creative reuse is whenever you face things that you never knew you'd have to face as a leader, <laughs> like a pandemic or tornadoes or um, you know racial justice movements, all of these things, creative reuse has a space in those as well. And we've been able to creatively serve the community throughout all of the turbulence of 2020. So things like paid internships for low-income youth. We've distributed 7,000 art kits to local kids in um, metro schools who have been disconnected from their classrooms for pretty much 10 months. And another um, project that we're really excited about is Repurpose with a Purpose with Southwest Airlines, where starting in 2021, we're gonna be getting about 2,000 of their leather seat covers every month. That's a lot, but some those leather seat covers go somewhere whenever they change them over. And we're going to actually be working with artists and students to repurpose them into really cool projects. Um, and a lot of those are going to end up to go on display at BNA, so the International Airport here. So just a lot of fun ways to be really creative and innovative with creative reuse, even in years like 2020, when a lot of other things are slowing down or stopping. Um, all of these materials I keep talking about, they add up to about 31 school buses. It's kind of a fun way to think about that amount of poundage. Um, so yeah, 760,000 pounds. And what we're really here to kind of focus on, I mean, I know we're here to talk about sustainability and creative reuse, but the most fun part is getting to actually be creative, right? And work with our hands. So I, I wanted to leave everybody with some opportunities to know, not just hear about creative reuse, but to really have some resources to be able to participate in it. Um, the holidays are a really great time to start exploring creative reuse because there's about a million ways that you can do creative reuse gifts and even wrap gifts um, without buying anything brand new. So I have included a ton of links in this and we, we don't have to go through all of them in detail, but this link is basically giving a ton of examples of how you can wrap your gifts this year if you do gifts and you don't have to use wrapping paper. And I would love to challenge everybody to just quit using wrapping paper, please. <laughs> because it's uh, unless you reuse it and reuse it and reuse it, because unfortunately, um, it's really hard to recycle because it's so ink heavy. 
Um, and unless you're reusing it, it's just going to end up in that place we talked about at the very beginning, which is super sad, away the landfill. But all kinds of ways to uh, wrap your gifts on this link. And then I think this is a word I heard before, but I wrote it e either way. Pinspiration. So um, it's really easy to get into the creative reuse holiday spirit, especially when you have the right Pinterest link. So Turnip Green has been, if you've never had Pinterest, it's, it's an awesome resource. It's basically very visual, organized into categories. So you don't even have to read a bunch of stuff, listen to a bunch of stuff. You see a picture, you click on it, and you learn how to do that thing. So there are thousands of different examples on this link that Turnip Green has pinned and organized for you. Um, all like holiday themed things you can do with materials around your house. And I just included a few examples of what you might see on the Pinterest page with items that I hear people asking me all the time, what do I do with these? I don't want to throw them away. So packing peanuts. I know a lot of people order things, um, especially in the pandemic. We don't want to go out into stores and especially during the holidays and you get those little packing peanuts. But those aren't packing peanuts, those are snow people. <laughs> um, so you can make packing peanut garland out of that. And if you click on the link in the presentation, I know you can't right now because it's on my screen, but if you, you'll get the link to this. Um, there's a YouTube tutorial of how you can do this at home and it's really fun. Planters, I'm sure many of you are nature lovers and have all kinds of planters around. So this is, Scrappy Planters is a link of how to use even like little pieces of scrap yarn. You don't have to go buy a whole brand new thing of yarn. You just like need this much. Um, and you can make some really cute holiday themed items. Bottle caps, more snow people. So once again, scrap ribbon, loose buttons. You can just use Sharpie or paint and bottle caps and you can make little snow people ornaments. Um, so just a few examples of many that once again, you can see on this Pinspiration link. And I always think it's fun to make cards, whether you celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah or birthdays, or you just want to send someone a, hey, how you doing card? 2020 is hard and it's going to be okay. Um, I think it's really fun to use scrap pieces of paper. Kim mentioned earlier that she, she gets a lot of junk mail. You can even th use things like junk mail to make cards um and and like little creative cute cards for your friends so if you also want to feel really fancy and like an artist you can make 3d cards and it's super easy i i know someone on this call is thinking i can't do this i'm not an artist because i just hear adults say that so much but everybody can do this and it's super simple there's um links 3d ornaments tree tutorial um and the pop-up gift card or pop-up gift box card tutorial and these will walk you through step by step and then i thought i i could also take like just a minute or two and show you super quickly how to make these Um, so some other ways you can take sustainable action in addition to um, being a creative reuse art instead of wrapping paper. Here's a few resources here. Um, a really great podcast if you still have a commute and you want to listen to one is Zero Waste. This is a local podcast, so they talk all day. We already talked about the Zero Waste Master Plan. Definitely give that um, a read. Then volunteering. If you want to volunteer with a sustainable organization, plug into something that's already existing and further their impact. Hands On Nashville is a super great volunteer um, resource. You can just type in kind of what you're looking to do and you can find what organizations are doing it. If you have questions, I always get a lot of questions about how do I recycle this? How do I compost this? There's a pretty um, thorough guide on this Metro Public Works site. If you still have questions, my email will be shared at the end and you're welcome to always reach out to me. I can usually, if I don't know it, I can usually figure, figure it out. 
And then social media groups, if you do have a Facebook, Facebook groups are um, a pretty great way to stay up to date and connect with people who also are really interested in environmental initiatives. Zero Waste Nashville is one of my favorite, but there are so many. And then I had to add, you can shop sustainably for holiday gifts at Turnip Green. So even if you, um, you're like, I like the idea of creative reuse, I don't have time to make my own gifts. There's a lot of artists who have already made um, sustainable gifts and by purchasing them, you would be helping our sustainable efforts and you would be helping the artists as well, which is really important. All right, so only one um, one little flub with our internet, but we made it to the questions for me part. <laughs> you are doing great. Thank you, everybody, for hanging in there with the technical difficulties, but um, I'm sure you've got some questions for Leah. So please share them again in the chat or the Q&A, and we'll let her answer a few questions, and then we'll let you guys go be creative with your night. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one question I've gotten, Leah, is what to do with all those plastic containers that um, recycling doesn't take anymore? So my immediate thought is to see if you can reduce them. So like if there's any alternative, it would it would be best to just not have plastic in your life. Um, if there's absolute, if you want help thinking through it, you can email me with the specific items because I'm not sure if they're like yogurt containers or what. But um, if you absolutely have to take them in, I would just try to figure out a way to maybe look at our Pinterest board and see if there's like a material that lines up with the specific one you're thinking of and see if there's ideas there. Um, but also I would encourage you to look at some like reuse stores that are popping up in Nashville, like the Goodfill. Um, they actually allow you to bring in your own container and keep reusing it and reusing it. And there's some grocery stores like that too, if it's a food item. Great. And then what about leftover house paint? Is there a place or use for that? Turn up green. Good. Good to know. <laughs> so great. I think, um, I, I think we've lost our link, but guys, we are going to share with you this presentation as well as all the links in it. And I hope you have been um, inspired. In fact, someone just wrote, your energy and enthusiasm are inspiring. Um, oh. how, do you stay so, how do you stay so optimistic? That's the question. <laughs> I bet Ryan is laughing upstairs. <laughs> uh, um, honestly, I feel like, um, you know, I wasn't so optimistic when I was teaching and I still cared a lot about the same things. I would say the biggest difference is I've been able to connect with people who care too. And I would say that a lot of people I know who care about sustainability often say they feel like islands. And that's why I'm saying connect on a Facebook group, like come to Turnip Green, connect in some way with people who can really hear your pain. And I would also stress taking action because you can always figure out what's wrong. But if you don't try to be a part of the solution, what's there to be hopeful about? Wonderful. Well, Leah, thank you so much for um, joining us today. Several people have said it's been inspiring tonight. And um, I, I personally am excited about trying to figure out how to wrap my gifts, although I do still have leftover paper. So I will, I'll be reusing that and using it this year. And we want to remind everybody that Friends of Warner Park has made this program um, possible, as well as Turnit Green Creative Use, Reuse, by um, allowing Leah to be here. Of course, she's the one that allows it. She's, she's amazing, and we are so appreciative. So thank you, and have a good night.